Uh, today I'm going to talk about making new things. Not just new things, but new, new things, and how I think it takes a lot of iteration, a lot of trial and error, and also just a whole lot of luck to make truly new stuff. I'm Patrick. Uh, I consider myself an entrepreneur and a game designer, almost equal parts. I think I'll be starting companies until the day I die, and probably making games, board games, video games, card games, along the way. <clears throat> I'm also a mentor. I work with a lot of game teams um, that aren't my own companies, but friends' companies. Uh, and I'm also a dad, which I'm very proud of. And this is the volcano that I live in in Austin, Texas, where it's like 120 degrees. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get back to the volcano. Uh, I've also worked on a lot of games. So um, I've worked on games from like the smallest screens possible, like little black and white cell phones with one bit graphics, all the way up to big 3D action adventure games like the Shoot 'em Up Stranglehold we made here in Austin. Um, made games for mobile, PC, console. Uh, also was a faculty member here at DePaul and I uh, was a faculty advisor on two IGF student showcase winners, Devil's Tuning Fork, and of course Octodad. Uh, these days I spend most of my time being the CEO of Farbridge. We are a virtual reality focused company, we also do augmented reality. That's why my friends talked me out of naming the company Blank VR. They said, that's, don't do it! Be super dated. So I just like, I snuck in AR into the name of the company. <laughs> I figured that would cover me. There's also a hidden V in the logo between the F and the A. <laughs> so just speak it like that. Yeah. Uh, at Farbridge, we're mostly creating uh, educational VR applications. So this is a screenshot from uh, a VR app we released called Masterworks Journey Through History. It's a 3D scan of uh, famous historical places around the world that you can experience in VR. This is the Mesa Verde Cliff Dwellings in Colorado, here in the United States. <clears throat> Funny fact, we recently applied for some trademarks, and we sent the trademark office some screenshots of our software that happened to also have the Farbridge logo in it. And they rejected them because they said, you just sent us a photograph of your logo painted on a wall. <laughs> We're like, no, it's actually a screenshot, we swear. <laughs> so we just had to resubmit with, uh, with like vectors and uh, the wireframes turned on so they could see it's actually a computer program. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm proud of that anecdote, but I still want my trademark, so we'll work on that. Uh, and of course, I can't help myself. I make video games. So uh, we've also recently created a division at Farbridge focused on video games called Farcade. It's like the arcade that takes you to faraway places. Yeah. Uh, we just finished showing our game Jar Wars at RTX conference down in Austin, Texas, where you play as brains in robotic jars doing battle uh, for Earth's greatest natural resource, which is the moon, of course. And it's a fun, ridiculous, funny multiplayer VR game. Uh, basically the polar opposite of the educational content we're creating. Now, uh, how many of y'all are game developers here? All right. I, I assumed pretty much everybody, uh, but I wanted to check. So the good news for, for all of us is that making games is easier than ever before, right? You know, there have been periods where it took hundreds of people and millions of dollars, and that's just not the case anymore. It's, it's very easy to make games. Uh, in fact, making stuff in general is easier than ever before between things like 3D printing and the internet. You can watch a video on YouTube for how to do anything. So it's great because if you want to make stuff, it's easy to make it, it's easy to learn how to make it, it's easy to find people to make stuff with. The bad news it's that everybody is making stuff. There's just tons and tons of content, whether it's video games or, or video or music uh, or tchotchkes. There's just a ton of stuff. And so it's really important that we remember that making the thing is only half of the priority, half of the story. And so here's kind of like the loop of making things, right? If you're a game developer, you want to make something. You want to make a game. You want to get it out into the marketplace. You want people to play the game or hear about the game and like it enough that they want to give you money so you can then use that money to make more stuff. And for almost any business enterprise, uh, you want to get into this virtuous cycle of making things, selling things, use that money to make more things. Right? That's the goal. You don't always want to depend on publishers or investors or your family. Right? You want to become self-sufficient. But... It starts out really, really easy to make the thing. And then actually making enough money to actually keep doing it is really, really difficult. It's very hard, very difficult to do. And you have to get past this very important point, which is 
You need people to talk about what you make. You need them to be excited about it. You need them to say, oh my god, Becky, look at that video game. <laughs> so how do you do it? How do you make something that gets people excited? How do you, uh, how, how do you make something that they just have to tell their friends? Like, oh my god, you can't believe this, I just saw this thing. There's a trick. Here it is. You make something worth talking about. Whoa, mind blown. I know, this is Patrick's game dev trick number one. Uh, you give them something so good and so new, you just kind of like blow their mind. Like, whoa, I just saw this thing. I have to talk about it. And a good way to do this is give them something that they've just never seen before. Uh, so here's a picture. I got a text from my buddy, Neil, down in Austin one day. And he's like, hey, you going to that party tonight? I was like, yeah. He's like, all right, cool, I'll pick you up. This is awesome. My friend is offering to pick me up. I felt awesome. I'm like, man, this is great. So I'm waiting outside, and up rolls this day. <laughs> <laughs> this awesome Batmobile tricycle. It's actually a tricycle. It's a motorized tricycle. <laughs> and it looks like if Bruce Wayne was like, you know what? I want a big one. <laughs> and all of Wayne Tech went out and built him a big wheel. It's incredible. And so he picked me up, and he, of course, he picked me up because he wanted to show off this new awesome thing. And now, here I am telling you about it because it, it blew my mind. I was like, wow, that's so new and cool and kind of ridiculous that here I am telling you guys about it in my talk. And so a huge part of that is, like, it, you want to make something that's good, right? It looks cool, right? If it looked dumpy, if it really looked like a big wheel or it looked like it was made by Play School or something, I'd be like, dude, what are you doing? I don't want to be seen in this. And if it looked like every other car or if it just, you know, looked like a bicycle or a motorcycle, I'd be like, okay, yeah, sure. Oh, great, you got a motorcycle. Way to go. So you want that combination of something good and something new. All right, so who knows what this is? David. That's right. This is Michelangelo's David the single greatest piece of artwork ever created by a human being, in my opinion. Uh, total masterpiece, carved out of marble, by hand, with hammer and chisel. Uh, absolute, stunning, stunning piece of artwork. And I bring up the David because if you want to make something that's good on purpose, you sit down and you're like, okay, going to make something good. You need to know what good is. And now I'm not saying that you have to love the Michelangelo the way that I do, or that you need to name your first son David, which I did, but <laughs> you do need to know what's good. And you need to know what's good for you, because what's good for me, you know, is the David, full stop. But you're your own individual, and you get to decide what's good for you, what you like, what gets you hyped. And so whether you're a fan of Project Runway, or Kanye West. You've probably heard about taste level, right? Taste level in fashion often is this term that's used to refer to, you know, <clears throat> how elevated is your taste? Are you liking, you know, the, the avant-garde? Are you liking the, maybe it's the thing that's trendy this moment, but there's, there's truly, I think, a sense of taste level that, that goes beyond trends to where you can say, hey, this is good. I like this. This is why. And so as creative people, I encourage you to really cultivate that taste level. Now, to do that, you have to try out a lot of things. If you want to know what good food tastes like, you need to have a lot of food. You need to have, like, really bad food. You need to have, like, Chef Boyardee, which, I mean, I kind of love Chef Boyardee. Right? <laughs> uh, all the way up to, like, the super designer avant-garde restaurants where they're serving you, you know, like, the other night we had peanut butter flavored, like, foam. And it looked like styrofoam, but it was peanut butter flavored. So it was pretty cool. I mean, I don't want to eat that every night, but I, I recognize pretty high on the taste level. And so especially in games, and Sarah touched on this, you need to know why you like the games you like. So if you have a favorite game, which you probably all have a favorite game, you need to play it like 10 times. You need to like maybe 100 times. You need to dissect it. You need to read everything there is to be, read about it. Read the strategy guides. Read the postmortems. Read the interviews with the creators. Figure out why you think it's good. Now, the creators are going to have ideas about why it's good. But you need to develop your own ideas about why does this work? Why am I enjoying this? Why is this game giving me, like, the good video game juice? And so I know for me, I, I really am focused on 
the fun in games. For me, that's sort of been my big focus. There's lots of things you can focus on. You can focus on emotion and storytelling and characters. Or you can focus on technology or graphics or simulation. But for me, I'm personally really focused on the fun. <coughs> and so I think about where fun comes from is like kind of like a volcano. You guys ever do those science projects in elementary school or middle school where you, you make like a big paper mache volcano and you've got like your baking soda in a box and your vinegar in a bottle. And they're both pretty benign by themselves, right? Baking soda is like a box of powder. Vinegar is like this stinky liquid stuff. But when you put them together in the volcano, a chemical reaction happens, right? They truly become something new. They, the gas erupts and makes a big giant mess and your mom yells at you for standing your floor. <laughs> and so I think, I think game design is like that. So when I'm thinking about good games, I'm always looking for the fun cano, right? <laughs> How can I take that baking soda, which is the challenges, the things I'm gonna ask the player to do, the difficult parts, the tests, uh, the jumps, the pits, the enemies, whatever the challenge is, the timer. And I want to make sure I'm combining that with the rewards. The rewards are the vinegar. Well, maybe it's the other way around, because rewards taste stupid. <laughs> I have to. And he's like, come on, let's beat him. I'm like, shut up, I'm getting <laughs> So for me, the coins, big big time reward. And and when you when you put the challenges and the rewards together in games, Fun happens, and you get this eruption of the fun, fun cano. So that, that's my focus, and that, that's a big part of what I think makes games good. There's lots of popular and successful games that are less focused on fun. That's okay. And also, you need to know why you're personally invested in a game. Why are you going to take the time? Why are you going to stay up late at night? Why are you going to lose sleep worrying about money? Why are you going to have fights with your very best friend over the dumbest stuff believable over a video game? You need to be investing. You need to know, hey, we're making something good here. This is worth making. We believe it's good. We're doing something bigger than ourselves here. And so I really encourage you to think about your goals, what you want, not just in a game, but in life. And if you can align your life goals with the individual games that you're making, the little things that you're trying along the way, uh, you can get purpose out of your work. And you know, for me, it really took me realizing, hey, you know what, I've actually been thinking about virtual reality field trips since like 1993 or 1992, and just remembering that conversation I had around the dinner table with my dad about, hey, we could use virtual reality to make these things. Uh, it took me remembering that and remembering that goal to give me the energy to get over the hard hump of shipping and actually shipping Masterworks and you know, having a real company. <coughs> and so that purpose let me focus and let me make something that I, I felt was good. Not, you know, maybe the world thinks it's good, but I personally think it's good, and that, that's what makes it a worthwhile endeavor for me. So I, I consider this Patrick game dev, game dev tip number two. All right, now let's get into it. This is the mad scientist part of the equation. It's not enough to make something good. There's a lot of good games on Steam. There's a lot of good games in the App Store, and they may not sell anything at all. The second big part of the equation is that they are new, right? The mad scientist came up with something crazy and ridiculous that you've never seen before, and it's because there was something good and something new that people took notice. All right, so how do you make something new on purpose? You guys probably see this one coming. You have to know what came before, <laughs> right? If I wanna invent a new language, you know, a new uh, verbal spoken language. I have to know every other language before, or I could have just accidentally end up, you know, reinventing Spanish, right? And it wouldn't be new. So you have to know what came before, and then predict what might come next. Okay, so I totally stole this idea, by the way. Uh, I asked Alex, you know, one of his most memorable moments uh, speaking, uh, you're meeting someone in our industry, and for me, that moment was meeting Stanley, right? Stanley, uh, editor in chief at Marvel Comics Forever, co creator of practically every superhero thing ever Fantastic Four, The Hulk, Iron Man, Spider Man, The Avengers, The X Men, the list goes on. And he came and visited us when we were making Marvel video games. And I had the chance to ask him, uh, I said, Stan, your comics were so innovative at the time, they were so different. How did you do that? And he goes, 
Well, I simply <laughs> thought about what had been written down before, and I wrote what wasn't written. <laughs> and part of the reason that Stan got away with this is that when he invented, you know, the Marvel Universe, he'd been making comics for like 20 years before that. He had already written everything. He'd written crime comics and horror comics and romance comics and failed superhero comics back in the first era of, you know, Captain America. And so he knew what had happened. He was, you know, maybe not even on purpose, but he was a student of the industry. He knew almost every comic that had ever been written because he'd either written them or ripped them off and made his own version of them. And so he could sit down and say, hey, we never did anything where... Uh, there was a teenager who was a superhero who wasn't a sidekick, right? That was Spider-Man. Or, hey, we can make a team of superheroes who are also a family, the Fantastic Four. Or uh, make a group of superheroes that have problems, real-life problems, like the X-Men. So you have to know what came before. And in video games, this is tough. It's really tough, because remember how I said it's easier than ever to create stuff. There's a lot of video games out. It used to be in the 90s, I could probably rattle off the 10 or 20 most successful games that came out every year. And on consoles, there wasn't an infinite number of games. Right? So having a console game, that was a big deal. That was an upper, upper echelon, very rare special experience. But the history of gaming is huge and vast, with thousands of games coming out a week, right? Growing exponentially. So, I encourage you to at least play the games of the game of the year from every year, right? Go back to like 90 and work forward or something like that. Or if you're working in a certain genre, play all the most important games in that genre. There's tons of lists online about, what are the 50 best RPGs? Well, go play them. You don't have to play all of them, but at least play enough that you figure out, hey, do I like this or not? Or why? Is this applicable to what I'm doing? Is this going to help me be a better game designer or not? And with that knowledge, you can predict what's next. Right, I'm not a language expert, but if I just barged in and said, hey, guess what, guys, I just invented a new word, hoop a -joop. <laughs> All right, somebody's going to be like, come on, dude, that's like an ancient tribal word from Indonesia. You didn't invent the hoop a -joop, yeah. <laughs> uh, So you need to know what happened before. And then you need to guess what's next. And the good news about what's next is that it's obvious, right? We work in an industry, the video game industry, and the industry has formulas for how to make things. If there's a hit, there will be a sequel. That's just how it works. There will be additions. There are people who will take a hit game and say, yeah, we're going to make this game, but it's going to have boats in it. It's all new with boats. Okay? Or they might subtract it. They might say, okay, we're going to take this hit game, and we're going to take out this other element. And then, we're, and then the combinations, right? We're going to take these two ideas and smash them together, right? I think Grand Theft Auto 3, uh, actually one of my favorite games, was just a great combination. There were tons of racing games. There were even crime-themed driving games, like Driver. You're a getaway driver. You just robbed the bank, and now you have to get away. Okay, well, those were cool. And there was tons of first-person shooters and third-person shooters and action games where you're just like a dude with some guns running around shooting some people. But it was the combination of those two that made GTA super unique. But these are the obviously new ideas, right? I'm, I'm giving you this list not so that you do this, because everyone else is doing this. Anytime there's a hit idea, everyone is doing this. So, very current example is the, uh, the PUBG phenomenon, right? Player Unknown Battlegrounds comes out, it's a hundred person multiplayer deathmatch, and there have been games with this idea or this mode, but this was the first game where that's all they did was giant uh, sort of battle royale, Hunger game style combat uh, in a video game. And notice I'm already referencing other movies and books and comics, right? They, they took this idea that was out there, they made a video game just about it. And then of course Epic swoops in and they do what they do best, which is they're like, oh, there's a hit game, ho-ho! Oh, we're gonna make one of our own. <laughs> and I make fun of them, but they're the best at it. They are the best at it. And I mean, they've been around for 20 years now and they made Unreal, and they made Gears of War, and they made some really great products, and these are games I like. And now, now they've done it again with Fortnite. And they, they took this game that they already had with some crafting, and they put Battle Royale in it, and that's a huge phenomenon. But guess what? The whole industry took notice. Right, so this is just a Google image search for 
Battle Royale E3 2018. And I think like <laughs> everyone <laughs> is making uh, uh, Battle Royale mode, right? Like Call of Duty, Battlefield. Uh, there's some new game I never even heard of, Fear of the Wolves, right? Like everybody noticed, like, hey, there's a lot of money over here. Let's go do this. So this is not a great place for, you know, independent, up-and-coming developers to spend their time, right? The whole industry is going this way. And so you can't just make something new, like, hey, let's add Battle Royale to Call of Duty. That's everybody else's job. You need to do something new, new. And so we're going to talk about the shark fin. And so the way that I think about new, new ideas is I think about the, the, this is, you know, sort of like a philosophical, logical equation. I think about the set of everything that's good, right? So if you know what's good, like, okay, it's a fun game with good characters and tight controls and it's, it's on the Xbox One. That's what I think is good. Okay, right? You've got your universe of good ideas. And then you've got the universe of what's possible, right? What's possible could mean a lot of different things for you. It could mean, well, we have three people and we have enough money to pay rent for six months. So that's what's possible. Three people, six months. It could be, hey, we just raised $5 million and we have $5 million to make a game with. Or it could be that you won a contest and you have a small grant and you're going to make a game with that. But you have to know what, what you can actually achieve and finish and ship in terms of what's possible. And some ideas just aren't possible, right? Like, I'd love to make an open world VR game that's the entire surface of the moon based on like survey data with you know, 100% realistic physics, you can even like shoot off satellites and be like totally realistic. That's just, that's just not possible for me. I don't have that kind of budget or time or scientific know-how. And then you have to know the entire set of what's been done, right? And even though it's the same size as the other orbs here, that's a slightly larger set of everything in the history of the world that's been made. But if you're looking for certain criteria, Xbox games, console games, mobile games, first-person shooters, role-playing games, strategy games, Games with pixel art. Whatever your filter is, you know, you need to be thinking about what's been done in that filter. And as you might imagine, these sets overlap, right? There are some games that have been made that are also good. There are a lot that aren't. Uh, <clears throat> there are some games that are uh, possible to make, some ideas that are possible to make, uh, that have already been done, right? Like, hey, this is possible, but it's already been done. Uh, and then there's this middle area, which is, hey, these are good ideas that are possible and done. And this is this this middle triangle is probably hit games. Yes, you have a question. So why is the what's been done and what's possible two separate spheres? Because if it's been done, then it's possible, right? Okay, so sometimes, maybe most of the time, one of the reasons, this is a great question, by the way. The question is, why is what's been done and what's possible separate sets? Um, one, of, one of the reasons is that um, a lot of what makes things successful is doing it first. And so, uh -huh. <clears throat> you know, it's possible to make the first Xbox One game, but we didn't, right? Someone else did. So, Nintendo, right? Making a game for the Super Nintendo, okay, that's technically possible. <laughs> I could do it, but there's no market at all, right? Super Nintendo is over, and so that's not really possible for me. So, in the strict strictest sense, is everything that's been done possible still? Eh, maybe. But for my purposes, it, it works as separate sets. And the reason for that is that I'm focused on this top triangle, which I call the shark fin. These are the ideas that are good and possible. They meet all your criteria for good. It's a first-person game for the Xbox One with pixel art and destructible environments and cars, and those are that's what makes a video game good, according to Patrick. And it's also possible to make. We have the right, we have the know-how, we have the engine, we have the people, we have the money, we think we think we can do it, and nobody's made that exact game yet. Right? It has not been done. Now, the big challenge here is that these orbs are moving all the time, right? The orb of what's been done is growing really quickly because people are making things and releasing things. So you probably need to be up on like what games have been announced but not even out yet. Because you might come up with the exact same ideas then. But if they beat you to market, it doesn't count. The, <clears throat> the orb of what's possible might be changing. 
New graphics cards are coming out all the time. New consoles are coming out. Uh, there's all new platforms that have, you know, completely different, that's making new ideas possible. Uh, and maybe what's good is sort of stationary, but, you know, as we grow and evolve, hopefully your tastes evolve here. You uh, grow to like new things. And so the crazy thing here is that <clears throat> what's possible is growing. What's been done is growing. And so you want to be as far from that as possible. You want to be like way up there, that upper left edge of the shark fin. That's why I showed the shark, right? You want to be swimming into the future on ideas that are really good. They've just become possible, and no one else has done them yet. <clears throat> yeah, so be like the shark. All right, uh, this is usually a gif in the presentation. If anyone can name this movie, I'll buy you a donut. Star Wars? Uh, Star Wars. So it's here to say you have to dig deep to get to new, new ideas. You're all wrong. <laughs> um, and so I want to I want to point out some ideas that I think are new new and some some kind of criteria for them well probably the the easiest criteria is that people just get it right if people are like ah, I see what you did there right they they get it it feels like a game maybe they're like wait no one made that yet and maybe it could even be like its own genre right those are clues like, hey, this is a really new idea. This is a really fresh idea. Let, let's go explore this. So here's some favorite examples. Um, Minecraft, uh, you know, it's, it, A, it's a great game. Um, super innovative at the time. You know, there were lots of games that had some notion of destruction. I made one, right? We spent millions of dollars on Stranglehold where you could blow up anything. But you couldn't blow up anything. You couldn't actually dig into the ground. You couldn't actually make new caves. And you certainly couldn't use that to build. And there have been games, action games, and first-person games where you could build stuff before, but none where that was the core mechanic. And all they did was make the graphics look like crap. And they got away with it. Okay, the graphics don't even look bad. They're, they're, it's pretty well art-directed pixel art. But it looks like retro graphics. They give you this all-new experience. It's like, hey, it's just an FPS, but you can dig anywhere, you can build anywhere. That's pretty special. Or Guitar Hero. The first time I brought Guitar Hero home to my family, Everyone could play it. Everyone in the fitness is pre Wii, mind you. Everyone could just pick up the plastic guitar, pretend to be a rock star, have a fun time, immediate fantasy fulfillment. Who doesn't want to be a rock star? Uh, and have a lot of fun. It was also a lot of fun to watch, right? The whole family could be there, cheering for each other, whoa, yeah. And of course, it did become an entire genre of a game, and it spawned thousands of Guitar Hero spin offs and sequels, and, and then Rock Band, and Rock Band sequels and spin offs. But, you know, it was like a special moment in games that, that clearly was so new, it created a category. Uh, and then our, our friends at Young Horses who made Octodad, right? Octodad is a ridiculous game where it's sort of a platformer, but you just do chores. And the, 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 the core challenge here is that the controls are really hard, because you're just like an average normal dad, right? You're just a dad doing dad stuff, like mowing the lawn, but he's secretly an octopus. And it's super ridiculous, and every time I ever talk about Octodad in public, it gets a big laugh. Uh, and I think it could be a whole genre. I mean, I'm mad they're not making Squid Cop. If you're making Squid Cop, you got to call me that. <laughs> I mean, I, I think that this is a whole thing, and, and if you look at other games that have gotten hot on YouTube and Steam, games like I Am Bread, it's ridiculous. It's just a game where you're moving around the world and you're a piece of bread! It's a wacky physics game! I think there's, a, I think there's something to it. Uh, and then Job Simulator. This is a game made in Austin, Texas, uh, by my friends there. It's a team I coach. And uh, they had an equally ridiculous premise. They said it's a virtual reality game where you go into the game, you put on virtual reality goggles, and then you pretend you have a job. <laughs> <laughs> right, so you work in a cubicle or a convenience store or a gas station. <clears throat> and you have a job. And it's you know just a silly physics simulator. <clears throat> but it works. People get it. They immediately laugh, and I, I think there's a whole genre of games to be made there. Uh, or another modern example is Rocket League, right? Like, it's a soccer game with rocket cars. That's just, how, A, it sounds amazing. B, it's super simple to play, because people have all played games with cars in them before, and occasionally rocket cars. And the rules of soccer are incredibly simple, right? There's a ball, there's a hole over there. You want to get the ball into that hole before the bad guys get the ball into your hole. Right, great. Got it. Super amazing. And of course, they were smart enough to immediately be like, hey, we got to protect this. So they started with all those additions of like, you know, rocket basketball and rocket hockey and things like that. 
someday they'll come up with Rocket Boat League, and you know, I'm sorry, you're, you, you have to cancel your indie game Rocket Boat League. <laughs> so those are some of my favorite examples of new, new games. And I think about the process for how do you find these ideas? How do you go about actually making games that stand out as being new, new? And uh, it takes a lot of ideas. You gotta catch them all. <laughs> it takes tons of experimentation. Nobody just comes up with these game ideas like on their first try. They're just like, oh, I, now I have a new, new idea, and it fits all of Patrick's criteria. We're done. Uh, no, you have to try out a lot of different stuff. And I know, because I was there, uh, the team that created Octodad pitched probably a hundred total ideas and narrowed it down to a dozen ideas they spent more time on, and they prototyped two totally different ideas, one of which was Octodad, and after that entire process, they're like, yeah, actually Octodad is like the one that's really standing out, and we're having fun, and we're making jokes about it. So, you have to catch lots of ideas, right? As much brainstorming as possible. Write down every idea you have. Good ideas, bad ideas, stupid ideas. You never know when you're going to need them. Uh, drop the ideas that aren't new enough, right? Rocket Boat League, eh, not new enough. It's a cool idea. I want to play that game. I like boats. I like guns. I like rockets. Not new enough. Uh, prototype the ones you like. Prototype the ones that you think have a chance of standing out. Find out if they're possible. Right, the only way to know, hey, can I make this game, is to go make it. And we were just talking with the horses earlier that I think one of the reasons that they were able to launch Octodad Dadliest Catch as a successful game, as their first game, was only because they had already made it once as a student game for the IGF, and Kevin had been on the team before that did Devil's Tuning Fork, and it took a lot of experiments and a lot of prototypes and a lot of practice to get to that point. And then you have to kill the prototypes that aren't good enough. And this is the hardest thing to do in the world, and I am not good at it. And I've let prototypes linger for way too long, and I probably have a dozen half-finished games and e as many half-finished screenplays. I just need to kill them. They're just they're not good enough. I need to get rid of them. So this is what? Patrick's Game, game Design Wisdom 3, 4, something? All right. So this is a really, really important point. You can iterate on an okay idea to make it good, right? If we're going to make Rocket Boat League, we can make it a fun game, right? We could add a turbo button and a machine gun button, and maybe instead of a ball, it's like actually a giant, like, dodecahedron or something. We can do all of that. We can keep working on that game until it is fun as heck, and everyone in the team loves it. They can't wait to finish it. But you can't iterate on an idea and make it new. In fact, the opposite is true. The longer you spend on a prototype, the older it gets, the more obvious it gets. Someone else is going to make it instead of you. So it's more important to start with a really new idea than it is to start with a good idea. Does that make sense? It's a weird idea, I know. All right, so I'm going to pick on Halo here for a second. So truth be told, Halo 1, one of my most favorite games. Uh, really, really took first-person shooters to the mainstream on consoles. But people have been iterating on Halo ever since it came out in 2001. And there are just endless, endless games about dudes in space in armor with big guns who like to shoot stuff and they shoot the bad guys with the big guns and they get more armor and so on and so forth, right? It, we've, we've probably worn this out. I still like these games. I'm picking on some of my most favorite games up here. But no one's going to be like, hey, guess what? It's all new. No, no, it's really not going to be all new again. Uh, but I'm not going to pick on ourselves with Wide Load because we tried to make a game using a lot of that formula and make it new. So this is the first game we released at Wide Load. It's Stubbs the Zombie. And it came out in October 2005 for the Xbox. And then it was also ported to Windows and Mac. And the interesting thing about Stubbs is that uh, when I got there, the team, almost everyone there was from Bungie. They had almost all worked on Halo in one way or another. And we had the rights to the Halo engine. So Alex had negotiated the rights and said, hey, I'm going to leave, but I'm going to make my own games, and I'm going to make them for the Xbox, so let me use the code. They said, okay. And so we had a bunch of new ideas, maybe even too many new ideas. The first idea was that, you know, hey, you've, you've killed video, you've zombies in every video game from Resident Evil to Halo to Doom, right? And so this is the game where you're the zombie. That's the big new idea. 
You're the zombie in a video game. You're the bad guy in a video game. Wow, crazy. Uh, you take revenge on the humans. You turn them into your minions. You go wreck havoc. Pretty new idea at the time. And when I first heard the pitch, like in 2002 or 2003, I was like, that's ridiculous. I don't even know if that's going to work. You're the bad guy? What? Uh, but it's a very new idea at the time. And so the way we went about making it is we basically started with the Halo engine. Right? It's a very possible idea. We had the Halo engine. Uh, the Halo engine had zombies in it. They had the zomb space zombies. They're called the Flood. And so the earliest prototypes were basically uh, code where you just change control. You could possess and pilot any AI around the map. And so it was sort of a free feature. Uh, and then uh, to be even more new, we set it in a retro future 1950s utopia before Bioshock, I might add. Uh, and it had comedic writing and a ridiculous soundtrack of retro songs. So it's like a pretty makeable game. Like Alex said, we made it with about 10 people and a ton of contractors. Uh, and, then, and then the game came out. And reviews of the game were so so, right? It probably would have been better with a much larger team or a bigger development cycle and more polish. We came out way late on the Xbox, right? The industry was leaving us. Microsoft was already laying the groundwork for the Xbox 360. We're one of the last Xbox, original Xbox games to come out. And then probably the biggest gut punch was this other game called Destroy All Humans came out. Now the pitch for Destroy All Humans goes something like this. Set in a 1950s utopia America, you play as a classic sci-fi villain who comes to the town, possesses the humans, and makes them do his bidding. Except instead of a zombie, you're like a little space alien. It's ridiculous. It's pretty much the same pitch, just with instead of a zombie as an alien. It was made by Pandemic, you know, very well established, very well respected studio, who'd already made lots of games. So they beat us out, and so all of a sudden, a lot of our new was gone. Right? People see the game, be like, oh, kind of like this real game. It's like, no, it's not like the. Oh, come on, people flip. But that was our fate. Uh, and then the other gut punch was that we had a, a sequel plan with multiplayer where you could play humans versus zombies. It was going to be awesome. That got canceled before we could make it. And games like Left 4 Dead came out. And then, of course, the whole zombie revolution or resurgence with Walking Dead happened. So timing-wise sucked. It just sucked. Destroy All Humans took the win out of our sales. We didn't get the really cool feature out, which was the ability to play humans versus zombies. And timing-wise, we just missed the zombie wave. But that's okay. It takes lots of tries. And so I'm not sharing this because I'm bitter. I'm sharing this to say, hey, we made a game that we thought was really new and really innovative and special, and it just didn't land quite right. So innovation is risky. It's very time consuming. We took about two years to make that game. Uh, and we couldn't innovate everywhere, right? The game probably would have been easier to understand if it was just set like in a cabin in the woods, right? Like a whole classic horror setting. So it was just like, oh, it's like a zombie game, it's like Resident Evil, but you're the bad guys. Got it. So instead we're like, you're the zombie, you're the bad guy, it's set in the 50s, it's futuristic, there's also robots, and so on. It was, it was probably trying to do too much too soon. It was just been like, hey, you get it, you're the zombie. Boop! Have fun. Alright, so this is a picture from Back to the Future 2. This is Marty McFly Jr. and his like virtual augmented virtual reality glasses and it, it, it's one of my favorite pictures because it really does look like a hollow lens it's pretty ridiculous uh and, and it's a great transition to talk about okay well what's next so i think alex and i have a similar philosophy about looking for business opportunities is that whenever there's a new platform whenever there's a big company like a microsoft or apple google sony spending a lot of money on new hardware that's an opportunity for like a little game to jump up and be like, hey, I'm going to run along. And I think that, you know, the timing for Young Horses with Octodad, Deadliest Catch was perfect, right? PlayStation 4 needed indie games. They were ready. They had a port working. They grabbed the rope and rode the wave. <clears throat> so this is somewhere else. This is what I'm talking about. And often new platforms have new features. They have new technologies that truly enable all new possibilities and because of that, you can make a new, new game. And so right now, I think we're in an interesting time. I'm mostly focused on the platforms along the top, virtual reality and augmented reality. And I'm not going to pitch you on why or how I think they're good or special, just that they're new. 
they're new, they fascinate me, they've captured my imagination. That's why I'm spending time, money, and attention on them. But there's lots of new platforms going on. There's a huge market of wearables, right? Smartwatches, fitness bands, things like that. There have been some games for them, but I don't know if there have been a breakout hit yet, so if you're interested in making a game really different from other things, take a look at <coughs> smartwatches, the Apple Watch, Android Watch. And a new platform I think is really on the verge of happening is voice assistants, right? Making games for things like the Alexa or uh, Google Assistant or uh, Siri, right? If you can make games that use audio and voice and you know maybe choose your own adventure story, I think this is going to end up being a new exciting platform where there's going to be hits and making content for those types of platforms. Soon you could be among the first. And so all of these platforms are very different from traditional games, they're different from PC games, they're different from mobile games, they're different from console games. They have new inputs, new outputs, new challenges. But that also means there's going to be new opportunities for people to make truly new, new stuff on them. Still takes a lot of luck, right? You could be on the right platform with the right backing and the right team and the right idea, and someone comes out and outspends you on marketing and takes all the wind out of your sales. Or something ridiculous could happen in real life, right? You could uh, be in an accident. You could uh, have a, tra a family tragedy. There could be something completely out of your control that just happens because real life happens that just slows you down and you miss the mark. And it's just bad luck. And so it's going to take a lot of tries to get a big hit. And so this is a favorite quote where luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. Right? There is luck, true luck. But if you know what you want, if you know what you think is good, if you know what your team is capable of, if you're looking for certain types of ideas and possibilities, when the opportunity comes by, you're going to be like, hey, I recognize that. I've thought about this before, and uh, yes, I do want to partner with a company like this. Look. Instead of someone coming by and being like, oh, here's what we're doing. And you're like, well, I don't really have a strategy. I don't have any goals. I don't know if this lines up or not. Maybe next time. And you miss that opportunity. So, way back to the beginning of my talk, I hope, I hope you get into this wonderful loop of making games, getting people to talk about your game and play your game, giving you money so you can make more games, and then you continue doing that for forever and ever. That would be awesome. Uh, I also have some other hopes for you that are not purely about financial success or, you know, total indie independence. Uh, and this is the advice I like to give to all my students or mentees. Uh, please stay in touch with good people. Right? I've been very lucky to have a long career. I've worked with probably thousands of people by now. And I really try hard to stay in touch with the people that I got along with, the people that I've had shared goals, shared vision, uh, the people have just done good work and been like, hey, you do good work. We should stay in touch. And I know that just by doing that, I've had opportunities brought to me uh, just because I've, I've, you know, stayed in touch with those people. Uh, I also encourage you to collaborate across boundaries. And that was a short way of saying this to fit on this slide, but, you know, work with people that don't look like you. I've been in a lot of rooms that are just white dudes. And I mean a lot, a shameful number over the course of my career. And there's nothing wrong with white dudes. I like them. I happen to be one. I'm raising one. We're okay. Uh, but, you know, work with people of different genders, races, uh, sexual orientations, religions. Get their ideas. Right? Go rooms full of people who all look the same tend to have similar ideas. You probably grew up watching the same cartoons or playing with the same toys, and you have the same points of reference. And if you just get a little bit outside that bubble, you can meet people and work with people who have different ideas, who grew up with different thoughts or different priorities. <clears throat> and you have the opportunity to make something new and new to you because of that collaboration. Uh, next up, take care of your friends, right? This is a stressful industry. It's hard work. Uh, I ended up staying up way too late this past week trying to hit a whole bunch of deadlines. And it would have only been possible if my friends were helping take care of me both in life and at work. And so I'm, I'm very grateful to them. Uh, and, you know, I try to return that. And so when I have friends in need, whether it's with a project or a business question or just life stuff, I really do try to make time for them because uh, it's, uh, it's the right thing to do more than anything else. 
You have to take care of yourself, right? This might be shocking, but you can make games if you're dead. <laughs> and so I think that's a spectrum, right? Yeah. You can't make good games if you're like super sick or half dead or dying. And so when I grew up in this industry, there's a lot of macho culture around, we're going to stay up all night and finish the milestone. And that's just not a good way to do it. You know, every now and then you have a late night. But I can tell you from personal experience, the best games I've ever made, the best products I've ever made, the things I'm most proud of, we did without a lot of crunch. We did without a, a lot of, without a lot of overtime. Um, and we, we just balanced our life and we took care of ourselves and we cut features when we needed to cut them so that we could ship. And finally, to echo Sarah's talk this morning, just be nice, right? It's free. You know, maybe someone's really getting on your nerves, but try to give them the benefit of the doubt. Try to lead with niceness. I think in the long, long term, it'll make your career much happier, much longer, and more full of opportunities. So I'm going to double down on that. Finally, we'll open up to questions. Also, Farbridge is growing. We don't have a job list, we have the opposite. If you do cool stuff and we want to meet you, feel free to fill out this form. It's Bentley slash Far Bridge Outreach. Just tell us what you're into, and if we have somebody who does what you need, we will reach out. So, perfect time. All right, now we'll open it to questions.